Well, hello, New Life friends. Glad to have you joining us for the message this week. If you ever lived uh, a couple hours south of here in the Twin Cities, you likely heard somebody say at some point in time, hey, this weekend we're going up to the lake. No one ever seemed to say which lake. Um, the responses never gave any hint that there was even more than one lake that people would go to up north. Um, but while their plans for the weekend sounded the same, we're going to the lake, we're going to the lake, we're going to the lake, what each person envisioned was uh, was certainly unique to them. They certainly had a cabin up on a lake that uh, they had, had gone with their family for many, many years, and they envisioned everything about that particular lake, which would be totally different from what a person maybe living right next door to them would be thinking when they said the very same phrase, hey, this weekend we're going to the lake. If I asked you, what comes to mind if I say the word lake or suggest that you go to a lake or go to the lake? I would guess that there would be a variety of different scenes that are triggered in the minds of each person listening to that. You might picture a couple of loons swimming nearby on a really, really calm evening lake. Uh, you might picture a sunset across the lake, um, maybe with dark clouds forming as a thunderstorm might be on its way. Some of you probably could picture canoes in the boundary waters. Others of you, others of you might think of Lake Superior and the, and, the, and the canal bridge area with the lighthouse and, and maybe a ship going in or out, maybe in the fog in the morning time. Some of you might think of ice piling up in the springtime on the shores of Lake Mille Lacs. Some of you certainly would think of casting your fishing line to the edge of a weed line and a bass just attacking your top water lure. 10,000 plus lakes here in Minnesota, each one slightly unique from all of the others because God loves variety. We go to a restaurant and we want dozens of choices because very rarely will everybody going to a restaurant want to order the exact same thing. We wear different clothes. We change our hairstyles. We probably drive, among the people at our church here, probably drive 50 different types of vehicles, maybe closer to 100. We use hundreds of different types of tools for a variety of different jobs that we come across. Our homes are painted with totally different colors from one room to the next. We have different breeds of dogs that are our favorites and others that we absolutely despise. I, for the life of me, can't figure out why God ever would have created a pug. Guys, some of you have hundreds of different kinds of fishing tackle and lures. You've bought magazines, you've read articles, you've watched videos to learn what makes big walleyes bite as they do. Some guys are better students of the fish that they are trying to catch than they are students of the unique makeup of their spouses that they've lived with for 10, 30, 50 years? That nah, wouldn't be true of any of us, right guys? Uh, maybe it would, okay? So in a world where we are grateful for choices, we love having variety, we think that differences are a good thing, why in relationships do people feel that differences between one person and the next are a bad thing? Why, particularly in marriages, would we determine that differences between a husband and a wife are a bad thing? Or differences between two siblings? Or differences between a couple of co-workers? Today is the last look that we're going to be taking on our series called Commitments for Building Solid Relationships. And so far, these are the commitments that we've addressed, all right? The commitment, we need to commit ourselves to a lifestyle of confession and forgiveness because we are deeply flawed sinners, married to deeply flawed sinners, deeply flawed sinners in relationship with deeply flawed sinners. Then we talked about how that we needed to commit ourselves to pursue a path of growth and change. Uh, it's just so devastating that people have lived in relationships for 20 years and have never done a significant change on, on, on their heart, on their personality, on their lives. We need to commit ourselves, third, to building deep bonds of trust. Last couple of weeks, we've looked at we need to commit ourselves to building self-sacrificing love, relationships that are deep in love, and that that isn't just the superficial, emotional type, romantic type love, okay, but it goes to the core of 
who we are being, and, and, and it goes to our wills to be willing to sacrifice for ourselves, even if the other person doesn't deserve it, even if the other person never responds um, with love in return. And today we're going to consider this final commitment. Solid relationships are committed to turning differences into strengths. So the story in the Bible that I couldn't escape this this week was trying to figure out, okay, is there a story that could address differences and all? And the one I couldn't get away with comes from the book of Genesis, all right? It's the story of Isaac and Rebekah. Isaac was the, was the son of Abraham, um, and, uh, and he traveled, or he had a, uh, Abraham had a servant that traveled to another country and brought back a wife for Isaac. Her name was Rebekah, and as time went on, Isaac's wife, Rebekah, gives birth to twins. Esau, the oldest, Jacob, the second. Isaac loved that oldest twin, Esau, his firstborn. The Bible descri describes him as being red-haired or red-skinned. Red um, and, and he was this, like, red-haired mountain man that I've patterned my life after, all right? Outdoors-loving, hunter-type, okay, wearing bearskin clothes. Masculine Esau was masculine Isaac's favorite. Rebecca, on the other hand, loved Jacob. Jacob seemed to be more of a homebody. We find him in scripture actually cooking, probably enjoying cooking, all right? And I can imagine he would have loved like reading books if he had been born thousands of years later when books first started to get printed, all right? So Genesis 25 tells us a story that some, at some point in their maybe teens or early 20s, uh, one day Esau had spent his day out hunting. He came home. He's absolutely starving. He rushes in for a meal, declares that he's going to die. Jacob is busy cooking lentil stew, and Esau actually is talked into giving up his birthright for a bowl of lentil stew. Not a real wise move. I'm not a real big fan of lentils, okay? But anyways, Esau says, what good is my birthright if I, if I die because I don't have any food? And Jacob is like, yeah. So birthright would have given, um, it would have given the rights of the, the, the head of household. And it also appears to have been that if you had the birthright, that meant that you got a double share of whatever inheritance gets passed on from dad to the children. Jacob trades it from Esau, but really takes advantage of Esau. Years later, after their father, Isaac, was old and blind, he declared one day that he was going to pass on the blessing, his blessing, to, um, to Esau. And um, he says first, Esau, go out and hunt and get me, get, get, some, get some wild game and then cook for me, you know, the type of food that I really, really love that comes from all the things that you love to hunt. And so Esau heads out, big day for him. He's going to get an animal, he's going to bring it home, and his dad is going to bless him in great ways. Rebecca and Jacob, they get, they get wind of what is taking place here and all, and they connive and they deceive. And, and, uh, and instead of Jacob or Esau coming in for the blessing, Jacob comes in for the blessing. And he's wearing fake skins on his arms to try to trick his dad that it's Harry Esau and tries to lower his voice and comes in with food that's, that's seasoned perhaps the same way that Esau would have done. And Isaac pronounces his best blessings not on his favorite son Esau, but by mistake because he's blind, he pronounces his best blessings on Jacob. Esau is enraged at this, so much to the point where Jacob feels that he needs to flee for his life, which he does. The family is just splintered in several different pieces. In fact, as, as I was considering this, I'm not sure that any one of those four individuals would have maintained a healthy relationship with any of the other three individual relation or three individuals in that family. Everything was broken. Rebecca, thinking that this would just be such a wonderful thing for Jacob to get the the, the best blessing from East, uh, from Isaac, excuse me, Jacob ends up having to flee. Rebecca never sees her favorite son again in her life. Till her very last breath, she never gets another glimpse of him. When, um, when Esau then realizes that he's been stolen from um, and, and is in a rage, that's the last picture that Jacob has of Esau. And he is gone for years. He acquires wives and children and many, many flocks. This family is totally torn apart and they are distanced, estranged from one another. And some words that characterize this family, jealousy, fear, bitterness, regret, distrust, rage, 
insecurity, confusion, and rivalry. And certainly many other descriptions could characterize what this family was like. This family was a mess and, and, and a warped response to the differences between those two brothers, between the differences within the husband and wife, okay? A warped response to those differences lies close to the heart of so much that went wrong. I want to share some lessons that, that can be connected to this story or that are tied to the differences that exist between people. The first lesson to be learned is this. Celebrate that God is a God of creativity and trust his sovereignty into how he dishes out that creativity. God doesn't exempt any of our relationships, including marriage, from bearing the touch of his creative heart. It's clear from this story that by choosing favorites, Jacob and Rebekah devalued the differences in the son that they didn't favor. <coughs> they loved the differences in the son that they, that they loved, but the son that we're told that they didn't necessarily love, it was like they didn't like the differences in that particular son. All right. Now, back in that culture, um, the oldest was always the primary heir. So, Rebecca is the worst example of not accepting God's sovereign choice of Esau as the oldest. And her conniving to trick her husband betrays mistrust in God's choice to make Esau the way he was. Essentially, Rebecca determined God has made a mistake. I'm the one who's going to fix that mistake. Esau shouldn't get the double blessing. Jacob, Jacob should. So she's pushing back on God's sovereignty. We can do that. And she isn't embracing the creativity that God poured out into the life of Esau, her non-favorite. So here's a thought. Since God created differences in every human being, those differences are not inherently bad. Now, I'm going to explain a little bit more about three different types of differences within, um, within uh, human beings. Okay, I'm going to explain that a little bit later, but listen carefully to what I'm saying. Since God created differences in every human being, every human being is created with inherent differences, those differences are not in and of themselves bad. Okay, now there's differences that come later in life as a result of things that happen to us, as a result of choices that we make, but, the, cho but the, the differences that we are born with, none of those are inherently bad. By begrudging God's choice to create your spouse with differences, what you're really communicating is that you wish you could have confined or limited God from fully expressing his creative design really like that, I really dislike that aspect of my husband. Wish I could have told God how he should have done a better job. That's essentially what we're thinking, okay? Um, so there's a second aspect here, second lesson that can be learned, and that is this. Embrace differences with appreciation and respect because they are often a channel of our greatest blessings. Differences can often be the precursors to great blessings that come into our lives. Might get a little bit sticky and muddy along the way, but our differences oftentimes lead to great blessings. We're gonna see it in this story, all right? Because much later in the story, all right, so far we've looked at what we see essentially in Genesis chapter 25. Much later in the story, Genesis chapter 33, after Jacob has been gone for decades, really, and eventually works his way back to uh, the land he grew up in, knowing that he's likely going to see Esau, hoping that his dad and his mom are still alive, finds out that his mom isn't alive. In Genesis chapter 33, he is coming home now with his entourage. He left with a walking stick, essentially. He comes back, two wives, a dozen kids, um, many, many servants, both male servants and female servants, and flocks of animals as they are, um, as they are caravanning back to the promised land where Jacob has been, or excuse me, where Isaac has continued to live and, and uh, not too far from where Esau has set up his life, all right? Esau somehow ends up in a situation where he's traveling to meet Jacob, and we're told that Esau is coming with a contingent of 400 men. Instant fear for Jacob. He is thinking to himself, Oh my goodness, all these years later, and Esau is still enraged. He's going to come, and he's certainly going to kill me because of how I mistreated him all those years earlier. All right? 
Jacob, think about this. He is wealthy beyond belief. The very thing that he had hoped for by tricking Esau out of his birthright and by tricking Esau out of the blessing or tricking, tricking Isaac into giving the blessing to Jacob that Esau deserved, that has resulted, I mean, his life has resulted in incredible blessings, exactly what he was hoping for. Yet when he finds out that Esau on his way, is on his way to meet him, we are told in Genesis 32, verse 7, Jacob was in great fear and distress. All of that wealth, without security, without peace, without unity, without reconciliation with his brother, there is an emptiness to it. Jacob feels it acutely. You see, their differences as brothers and the generation above them, their different, the, the differences in their parents, in, in differences that manifest themselves in who they loved more and who they loved less, that had caused deep division, it had caused great fear, it had caused mistrust. Mistrust, And in spite of how those differences were, were stoked in rivalry years earlier, they end up, when they meet, they end up um, being blessed with reconciliation that is as God-honoring as any reconciliation that we can find in the Old Testament. This is what we're told, Genesis 33, starting at verse 1. Jacob, as he's traveling, Jacob looked up, looked, looked up, and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So Jacob divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maidservants that he had also had children with, all right? He put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Ra Rachel and Joseph in the rear, and he himself went on ahead. So he was the first one to go. <clears throat> and as he's approaching Esau, he bows down to the ground seven times as he approached his brothers. Certainly something significant about bowing down seven times, all right? But we're told, verse 4, but Esau ran to meet Joseph and embraced him, threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And they wept. I believe they wept because they realized how much they had lost by allowing their differences to separate them. I believe they wept because they realized how much they had lost by allowing their parents' preferences, their parents' differences, to end up dividing them as brother to brother and how, much, how many years had been wasted in estrangement from each other. Grace gets the final say in this relationship. And to be totally honest, it's Esau who exemplifies it the most. Their differences create, had created a rift that ends up getting healed through forgiveness, which, which I believe is what, Joseph, or what Jacob valued most at this point in his life. So there's one aspect of the story that just kind of popped out at me as I was just considering, and that is this. Jacob had traveled from a long distance away. Esau had traveled from a long distance away. They knew that they were on this course that would, where they would meet one another, and they were both traveling toward the middle to meet one another. The reconciliation comes about because both men lean in toward the other man, moving towards each other with hearts that are seeking to settle their differences rather than to entrench them even further, decades after they were first caused. The example is all the more powerful because of how fully polarized they had been. If this reconciliation is among the, of, 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 among the, the most exemplary in the Old Testament, the polarization, the rift between these two brothers is among the worst that we see in Scripture as well. So related to that, here's another principle. Change is possible when we see our differences as grace or avenues toward grace instead of obstructions of grace. Now, I reflect on that story and is one that gives me hope for today for our world. All right, the, the enmity, the hatred that has surfaced more and more in our culture, the polarizing, um, especially within individuals with um, uh, different political opinions, um, 
is, is causing there to be this, just these growing and massive rifts in our society. Jacob and Esau experienced similar, similar polarization, yet in their reunion scene that shows their maturity and their wisdom, they are no longer willing to treat each other with contempt or disrespect. We see a lot of the same type of polarization in our country, in our state, yeah, even in our community, even perhaps within people in our own church. But let me ask you this question, are we really willing, as Christ followers, are we really willing to consider hundreds or, or maybe thousands of people in our own communities as enemies because of our political differences? Friends, I know where that game plan comes from. It doesn't come from Jesus. It comes from our enemy. <clears throat> Think for a moment of the political party that you disagree with. Think for a moment of the individuals in that political party that you perhaps work with or that are members of your family or that you live right next door to. And you disagree with them. And it's okay to disagree on the issues, all right? You know, don't you, that as you are considering them, if Jesus was giving any advice to you, he would be whispering in your ear to love them with his love, right? You know that. At our elders meeting this week, one of our elders asked God during our prayer time, God, how do we show your love to our world? Well, I know part of that answer. I mean, the, the question was asked, um, you know, with give us specifics, give us details of what that's going to look like and all. But the big picture is, how do we show you, um, God's love to our world? Not by rejecting them, not by mocking them, Certainly not by isolating ourselves from them because of our differences. I ask this question, wouldn't the cause of our gospel, wouldn't the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ be better served by leaning in on loving them the way that Esau did, even when his brother had exploited him so horribly many years ago? The common practice of responding to our cultural divides by picking a team and then dismissing everyone on the opposing side of the debate. You wanna know something? That reflects Esau and Jacob and Rebecca and Isaac at their worst, at the beginning of their tragic family story. That's essentially what they were doing. This is my team. Dismiss the other team. Let the other team be unblessed. Let them go ahead and move away. But determining to love in spite of our differences and in spite of our history of pain, that's Esau and Jacob at their best. Listen to this. The problem you really need help with is not so much that you are different. But the problem is how the sin inside you causes you to deal with your differences in a way that deepens your troubles rather than solving your troubles. Choose grace. Just choose grace. I've stated this publicly and in smaller conversations over and over again for many, many years now, okay? Relationships are God's favorite workshop to build character into your life. Your relationships are God's favorite workshop to build up your character, your integrity as an individual. And for those who are married, this needs to be added. Your marriage is the primary tool that God wants to use to spur you toward holiness. There's been books that have been written essentially along the lines of God's primary purpose for marriage is not to make you happy. God's primary purpose for you is to make you holy, all right? If he can make you holy, happiness and joy is going to come as a result of that, all right? But there are a lot of people who on the surface are happy without any holiness involved. This is God's primary tool for people who are married to be refined and reformed into his image of holiness. Your marriage is where God is often able to rescue you from you. All right? And why is that true? Here's why. Because only deep commitments of love can spur you to go through the pain of addressing your differences with humility and submission and forgiveness. So when you confront your differences with a commitment toward deepening grace, know this, God will be with you in your struggles. 
Now, last thing I want to share, kind of mentioned it, alert, alluded to it a little bit earlier, right? It's important to know which types of differences we need to submit to God for refinement, okay? So I'm going to close by clarifying three areas of differences differences that are relative, uh, relative to change and growth, okay? So the first one is this. There are differences in how God has wired every human being, okay? I mentioned hardwired every human being. I mentioned that earlier in the messages, message, okay? The differences that God created you with, all right? your core personality, all right, your innate physical strengths and weaknesses, how your mind works and functions, how it ex where it excels, where it struggles. Um, I, for instance, I, th I thrived in math courses growing up through about 10th, 11th grade. Then I started to get bogged down a little bit, all right. I was hopeless in art class. My ability to draw anything with any type of symmetry where one side looks the same as the other side, it was, it was just... <coughs> ridiculously pathetic, all right? I feel under no compulsion to overcome my horrendous artistic inabilities. God doesn't care about that, and I'm grateful that he doesn't, all right? That's something he just has never wired my mind to be able to, to do really all that well, and that is okay. That difference from from anybody else's fantastic artistic abilities, God doesn't want to make us the same. He doesn't really care. All right, so those off limits, no need to change those, no need to touch those, all right, those core aspects of um, uh, our innate abilities, all right. I'm not talking about our sinful nature, okay. All right, the second thing, there are differences in how your neutral life experiences have formed you, okay. Your neutral life experiences, there are differences in how they have formed you. Thousands of interactions that you've had with people and events have left their influence on you, all right. So where these are not tied to sin, let them be. For example, it didn't matter to God that Esau's dad helped Esau learn to hunt and ended up resulting in Esau having a love for hunting. That didn't matter to God. And it didn't matter to God that Jacob's mom trained him to be a cook. Those types of learned differences are inconsequential. All right? But where these differences are causing pain or offense, they need to be humbly surrendered in preference, preferential treatment toward the other person. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23, he said this, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good but the good of others. So here's an example that came to my mind this week. Several years ago on a hiking outing um, where our daughter Lindsay and her husband Sam were going out with several of their friends, um, one of their best friends fell about 30 feet um, down a cliff, I think bouncing off like um, branches or, or trees that were growing out of, of, of the, uh, um, you know, of the cliff kind of going down and all. By the time he landed at the bottom, he was really, really um, badly injured, all right? As a nurse, Lindsay was shaken by the extent of his injuries in deep, deep ways. Her husband Samuel loves to hike. He doesn't hike in as risky of situations as he would be prone to do, and he does that out of love and respect for Lindsay. Why? Because he knows how much she was shaken by what she saw happen to one of her best friends, all right? So those are two aspects of differences, all right? Differences in how God has hardwired every human being. We leave those alone. Differences in how your neutral life experiences have formed you, okay? So some of them, um, if they're not tied to sin, don't need to do anything about those. If others of them create, um, create a offense or pain in the lives of somebody near us and all, then we should be willing to submit them and to back off and just totally surrender those areas, all right? But here's the third area. Um, there are differences in personal sin and weakness, and this is what we must submit to God to be changed in his workshop. These are the sin-affected, sin-caused differences in our lives, in our relationships, that God wants to be reformed, formed again, and aligned with his perfect plan and desire for our lives. Let me close with these thoughts. One of the deepest conflicts that we can find in the Bible, that rivalry between Jacob and Esau, it led to reconciliation and blessing. Differences don't always have to end in conflict and catastrophe. 
Jacob and Esau were better as a result. God has the capacity to produce incredible good out of the differences between you and a seemingly difficult person in your life. In the hands of a redeeming and transforming God, any difference can eventually lead to blessing, to growth, to strength, and to maturity. May we commit ourselves toward that path in the most significant relationships we find ourselves in. Let me bow for a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you for the relationships that we find ourselves in. None of us is related to a perfect individual and, and none of those individuals are related to a perfect person because we know we have flaws. We fail you on a regular basis. We, we are sinners just like everybody else trying to relate to other sinners. And, and when we come into relationship with one another, God, oh, there are just so many opportunities for conflict and for pain and for eventual estrangement. And up in heaven, you're looking at that and you're saying, you, God, the Father, came up with this plan to sacrifice your preferences for how your son Jesus would be treated. And you sent him to this earth and Jesus, you were willing to go to the cross to bridge that gap, first vertically between us and you, but then to help bridge the gap horizontally um, in, uh, between us and the people we have relationships with, including in our marriages, including in our deepest of friendships. And God, there's many people who want to push back on your creativity and say, don't like the differences that you created other people with. Uh, if we could see the, the, the greatness that comes out of variety um, in, in, in how you've created every aspect of this world, God, then, then we can value that and, and we can believe deeply within our hearts that you can use that creative variety, God, to, to bless us in the long run. We can see that our differences don't need to um, end in conflict and division, but they can end in unity and in, in, and in just remarkable reconciliation. May we work toward that end. God, help us to differentiate and to, to understand that differences in how we are created by you generally don't need to be touched or don't need to be changed. Help us to see, God, that our differences that come from the history of our lives, experiences that we go with, God, that, that we need to have sensitivity um, toward other people around us who have gone through different experiences, God, and, and that we might need to back away from some of our preferences in order to most bless and protect and honor them. But then, God, in these areas where we ask and invite your Holy Spirit to reveal to us what are the characteristics, what are the differences that we have with other people that are, are rooted in sinful behavior? God, we, may we address those with confession and a willingness to, to, to seek forgiveness and to grant forgiveness, believing that as we do so, grace can be poured out into our relationships, God, and the very differences that Satan would want to use to divide us, those differences could end up being used, God, to unite us and, 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 and cause our roots in love and in grace to grow deeper than ever before. Oh, that's my prayer for myself and my key relationships. It's my prayer for each person watching. And we ask that you would do that in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So next week, uh, there will not be a video. Uh, we've got actually the Teen Challenge Choir from Brainerd who's going to be coming and ministering at our worship service. Um, if you can attend, uh, we're going to have combined worship at 10.15 uh, next Sunday morning. We're going to have a potluck meal downstairs. We'd love to have you come for that as well. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>